If you have your Bible with you this morning, uh, I invite you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. You see the uh, passage here on the screen in front of you, Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 through 14. And today, as Ben has already alluded to, as many of you are already aware of, we are going to begin the new year by taking communion together. And um, a way of a way of just uh, reminding ourselves of who we are as a people who've been chosen by God and, and reminding ourselves that our lives do not belong to us, but they belong to Jesus and that we're responsible for the way in which we walk with him. And the theme for today and beginning this has to do with the title of the sermon, Facing the Future by Remembering the Past. And we're going to use this passage out of Deuteronomy. We could have used any number of passages out of Deuteronomy, but we're going to use this one today because of the overall theme of Deuteronomy and and what it speaks to. But before we do that, I want to share something very personal with you as soon as I turn on the clicker. Now, for those of you who've ever been to my hometown of Bront, you might think that this is the golf course because this is about how green the golf course is. It's not. It's the cemetery. Uh, You can look at this, and uh, Cody, I know that you can identify with this. This is why I never loved to play the game of golf because when this is what you're playing, kind of uh, golf course you're playing on, you don't want to do it. But again, this is the cemetery. And this is the headstone uh, for my father and for my mother. Now, I'm going to share a story about something that my father used to do, and it was very much a a part of his generation, not so much a part of my generation, and definitely not a part of my children's generation, and that is growing up on a regular basis, Daddy would take us to visit graves of family members. And it would be family members in towns, you know, where my grandparents lived, and um, uh, it wasn't like we were going far and wide to search, but, but places that we were going to anyway. And, and part of the reason for this is because I had a brother that I never met because he lived six months and six weeks and died on my mother's birthday before I was born. And so he was buried, he, he is buried in a town where my grandparents were and where they are now buried. But daddy would take us to visit the graves of departed family members and we would, we would go to the grave and we would stand there, we would look at the headstone, uh, we would probably share a couple of stories Uh, something about that person or those people. It was a way of passing down some family history that we might not have been aware of. And then because of who my father was, many times we would pray. And we weren't praying to our dead ancestors or anything like that. But we were praying to God and thanking him for the lives of these people who had gone on before us. Now, to you, this may sound like a terribly morbid thing to do. But it really wasn't. Because it it was simply a reminder that this life is not forever in this body, in this world. These days will come to an end. And so without making a big deal about it, Daddy would would, uh, just kind of remind us of this. Well, Daddy died in February of 2010. And and sometime after uh, his death... Uh, It took a while for my mother to put the headstone up on his grave for her to decide how she wanted it to be. And when she did, one time, uh, we were back in Bront visiting with her. And my son Nelson and his family were there with us as well. And so in true Barbie fashion, we went to the cemetery and and we stood and we were looking at the headstone, which at that time just contained my dad's name on there. And as we were standing there, Nelson and I were, were talking about some things and and we were, uh, we were laughing because there were a lot of funny things about my dad, just things that just, he was a very unique man, a very great man. But we were laughing about some things. And in the middle of this, and I, you guys know me. You know that I'm going to cry, so just get ready for it. But in the middle of this, toward the end of that time, Nelson looks at me and he says, Dad, I hope that someday I can be half the man that granddad was. And that you are. And I thought, this is such a sweet thing to hear from my son. Well, yesterday, my brother and sister and I had a FaceTime call. We've decided that we're going to do this on a regular basis so that we keep up the relationship among ourselves. My mother and father poured so much 
time and energy into a good family relationship that we don't want to let all that they did go to uh, ruin just because we don't keep up with each other on a regular basis. So in this FaceTime call yesterday, I, I asked a question. I said, hey, what's a, what's a good Christmas or New Year's memory that you guys have? You know, the same things that you ask in a life group that sometimes people look at and go, oh, those icebreakers. The same things you ask in a life group, you can do this with your family. And you hear great stories. And my brother said, he said, well, this is not exactly a favorite Christmas memory. But do you remember the time that Brother Edmiston's house caught on fire? It was right around Christmas. This retired pastor lived right across the street from us. I might have been first grade or second grade. I'm not sure I was even that old. But one night his house caught on fire. And Randy said, we didn't know what was going on until somebody started banging on our front door. And, and, and they awakened us. I said, yes, okay, I remember looking out the window. And I couldn't see the fire because the volunteer fire truck was parked, you know, in front of our house, in front of his house. I couldn't see the fire, but I could see flames coming up over the top of the fire truck. And I could see smoke coming around, billowing around the front and the back of the truck. And I said, the thing that I've always remembered about that fire was that Daddy was the one who, who took him to the hospital, which was just around the corner, who took him to the hospital in the back of our station wagon. And I said, for weeks, any time we would get in the station wagon, there was a lingering smell of smoke. And it made me sad because I knew that he had died. Here's the rest of the story. Randy said... Y'all may not be aware of this. But Daddy was the first one to enter the house. He went into the house trying to find our neighbor to bring him out to safety. Daddy was overcome by smoke and he collapsed. Daddy had to be brought out to safety himself. And then they found our neighbor in the bedroom. And more than likely, he had already died of smoke inhalation before anybody got to him. So the rest of the story for my son Nelson is, Nelson, when you say that you want to be like your grandfather, what you're saying is you want to be the kind of a man who will run into burning buildings to seek and to save the lost. And that's the kind of man he is. So by remembering the past, again, there's great wisdom in telling us how we are to live in the future. And this is what Moses is going to tell the children of Israel as he is gathered up on the banks of the Jordan on the other side of the Jordan, getting ready to bring them into the promised land. Before we start reading our passage, and we're going we're gonna to break it up and read it in small chunks. Before we start reading our passage, I just want to give you a reminder of what the meaning of Deuteronomy is. For those of you who've been with us, you know that I say this every time. But for those of you who are new, you may not be aware of this. Deuteronomy simply stands for the second giving the law. Deutero is second. Theonomy is law. So Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. God has led Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt. And for 40 years they have wandered through the desert, through the wilderness on their way to the, to the promised land. They could have gotten there sooner if Israel had been obedient, but they weren't. But during those 40 years, God is, is giving Moses the law. And see, this is an incredible thing about Moses. Moses is the kind of man who is willing to take dictation. He's willing to take what God wants to communicate to his people, and he's able to write it down accurately. And then as he gets it, he's teaching it to the people. And he's been doing this all through this, these 40 years in the wilderness. 
But now as they are gathered on the banks of the Jordan, getting ready to come into the land, he is summarizing. He's encapsulating. He's giving it to them again. Why? Because he wants them to remember. You know, this is one of the reasons why we do communion on a regular basis. We don't do it as often as a lot of churches do. There are many churches that will do it every week. We don't. But one of the reasons why we do it on a regular basis is because we always need to be brought back to a place of of remembrance. We can't afford to forget. So keep that in mind as we are working our way through our passage today. Here's our takeaway that I want you to remember. We prepare for the future by remembering the lessons that God has taught us in the past. And sometimes, as I've already shared in my, my story about my father, sometimes those, those lessons are things that he has taught us personally. Sometimes they are lessons that have come down to us through our family. But in God, in his economy, we don't want to waste anything. Let's begin a reading in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning of this passage, Moses says this. He says, And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live. And go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. So the first thing that we see in our passage today is this. Moses says that we are to listen and do so that we may live. Moses says to the children of Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that, that I am, am giving you so that you may and, and do them so that you may live and go in and, and take possession of the land. The first thing that catches my eye in, in, in this first verse is this, this phrase of statutes and rules. You know, what Moses is referring to here is he's referring to that which has been written down on the Exodus. And Moses is setting the the foundation here for, for who we are today. We are to be a people of the book. Moses in this time would call it the statutes and rules of God. In our day today, we would call it God's word. We would call it scripture. We are to be a people of the book. This phrase, statutes and rules, is used 12 times throughout scripture. And it's always used in the Old Testament. And Moses is the one who is responsible for seven of those uses of this phrase. And he, of the seven times that Moses uses it, he uses it six times in the book of Deuteronomy. And of the six times that he uses it in the book of Deuteronomy, he uses it four times in this passage that we are doing, that we are looking at today. So as we are reading scripture, this is one of the things that we take note of. We look for phrases that are repeated in, in, in whatever the passages that we're reading. And we take note of, you know, there's a reason why, why God has them there. And it's like, why is that there? Well, it must be important. If Moses is going to re- repeat this four times in these 14 verses, then it must be important that we understand what the statutes and rules of God are. Moses has been leading and he has been teaching the children of Israel on the Exodus. Moses is a teacher. We look at Jesus and we see that that Jesus was a teacher. Oftentimes that's how Jesus was greeted. Hey teacher, you know, blah, 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 blah. And when we look at the the great commission that is given to us in, in Matthew chapter 28, a large part of that great commission is to go not only to share the gospel, not only to baptize, but to teach disciples what to do, how to obey the word of God. We are a people of the book. We are a people of the written book. We are not a people of of, of pictures. We're not a people of symbols, of, of images. Our primary instruction is a book. And we see this carried through the New Testament, not only in the life of Jesus, but we see this in the New Testament with Paul when he is giving instructions to to Timothy and to Titus and he's, he's, he's telling them what to look for in the men who are going to lead the congregations as elders. And he has two requirements for these men. One is that they must be able to lead. And the second is that they must be able to teach. 
And as we're looking at the life of Moses, we can see that this is certainly part of, of the example that Moses has set before us. Moses could lead. He led the children of Israel for 40 years through such difficult circumstances. And Moses could teach. He heard what God was saying. And he taught the children of Israel what God was saying. We are a people of the book. We pay attention to the, to the progression of what we see here in verse 1. Moses says, listen and do so that you may live. Listen, live your life in submission to the word. One of the things that we're faced with, and it's not new to us, it's been this, it's been this way for every generation who has ever lived since this time. The, the temptation that we always have is, is I want scripture to submit to me instead of me submitting to scripture. And there's always this temptation that we have to, to twist scripture, even though we wouldn't call it twisting scripture, but to make it more pleasant, to make it more memorable for the people who, 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 who disagree with what it says and who just are, are aghast that we would even take it seriously. But Moses says to the children of Israel, he says, listen, live your life in submission to the word. And then he says, do the word. For all of the reading that we do, for all of the study that we do, and I hope that you are making plans for doing some kind of a study in addition to your reading, for all of that that we do, that it, it is an intellectual pursuit because we need to learn and we need to grow in what we know. But, but the end result of all of this is, is we need to do the Word. We need to do the Word. And that's how we... That's how we we show that we're understanding what the Word is all about. The, the, doing the Word, again, it's, it doesn't mean that it's just intellectual, although it is intellectual, but it is a whole person pursuit. But there's a, there's a promise with this. Moses says to the children of Israel, before you go into the land, if you listen and if you do, you do that so that you might live. Now, there's no guarantee that this life you're going to live is going to be easy. And there's no guarantee that it's going to be comfortable. And there's no guarantee that, that you're going to win friends and influence people. But there's every guarantee that you're going to be satisfied. There's every guarantee that you're going to have a life of impact. There's every guarantee that there's going to be fruit associated with your life. And there's every guarantee that you're going to earn reward in heaven which is not something we talk about very much, but something we should. Yes, Christians who are saved, who are responding to what Christ has already done for them, they, they, they make it their aim to do good. And part of the reason why they aim to do good is because they want to earn reward in heaven. So Moses tells the children of Israel, listen and do so that you may live. But look also at what Moses says here. And we need to keep this in mind. He says, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Notice what he says here. One, he's saying that God has already provided the victory. God is giving you the land. And it's not like he's telling you to go do something that he hasn't equipped you to do. And he's not telling you to go do something that you're going to go do on your own apart from him. And he's withholding himself to see how you do. No. God is giving you the land. And he's been telling this to Israel <coughs> all the time during their journey. God is giving you the land, but you still have to go in and take possession of it. This is one of the quandaries that we can't always answer why these things are this way. This is the way in which God works. God is the one who is in control. God is the one who secures the victory. But he still requires our participation. You and I did absolutely nothing to save ourselves. You and I did absolutely nothing to earn God's favor. You and I did absolutely nothing to make God look at us with, with, with pleasure. You and I did absolutely nothing to make ourselves good enough. Until God saved us, you and I would spit in the face of Christ if we had the opportunity because we did not love him. Jesus doesn't save people who love him. Jesus saves people and causes them to love him. But then he sets us on a life of growth and grace. 
And that growth that we call the sanctification process requires our participation. So there's never a time that we just sit back and say, God's got it. I don't have to do anything. There's never a time that we sit back and say, you know, uh, I'm good. I'm good, God. You know, let's, let's just go from here. No. It's like it's time to get our hands dirty. As we used to say, or as I've said from James chapter 1, from that time on, we live with dirty hands and a clean heart. We help out widows and, 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 and orphans in their, in their troubles. But we do it while we're loving God. So Moses is telling the children of Israel, God is securing the land, but you are the ones who are going to go in and, and, and sanctify. You're the ones who are going to go in and occupy the land. One of the reasons why, as I'm thinking about this, one of the reasons why I really like this phrase, the statutes and rules, when I was looking to see where else it's used in the Old Testament, I was reminded of the fact that it's used in my favorite verse in Ezra chapter 7. A number of years ago, I remember preaching a sermon. It might have been the first sermon of that year. It was early in the year. But I had just been so struck by Ezra 7 verse 10 where it says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. And in the book of Ezra, this comes as Ezra is beginning to to take the journey where he's going to take the people back to Jerusalem following the the Babylonian uh, uh, conquest and Babylonian exile. He's going to take the people back into Jerusalem and begin the process of, of rebuilding the temple. What a great thing to do before you begin any kind of a project. What a great thing to set yourself to do, even at the beginning of 2023, to study God's statutes and rules and to do them in your own life and then to teach them to others. Well, we also see in verse 2 a very sobering reminder that we need to be aware of because it's in verse 2 that Moses says, You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. This is a very sobering reminder when when Moses says that we, we, we cannot add to and we cannot take away from God's word. Why? Because if we do that, he, Moses says, it destroys, it, it weakens our ability to obey God's word. In one of the articles that I sent out to you, one of the links that I sent out to you this week, it was the article from Tim Challies where he talked about the difference between reading for familiarity and reading for intimacy. One of the reasons why we highly encourage you to, to pick a reading plan that will take you through all of Scripture on a regular basis and to, and to do that, whether or not you use the same plan every year or not, or every two years or every three years, is we want you to be familiar with all of Scripture. Because as I'm reading this in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I'm, I'm seeing that, it's like, where have I seen that warning before? It's in Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. Here's what, here's what the Apostle John says to the church at the end of Revelation. He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So here we see Moses saying the same, this thing to Israel before they go into the promised land. And we see John almost at the very end of the last book of the Bible saying the same thing to the New Testament church. And, and what that should do is that should, that should cause us to go, oh, wait a minute, this is important. This is a really important thing if it's repeated throughout Scripture. And especially when you look at it in Revelation it's within three verses, I believe, of the end of the book of Revelation. What do you do? I'm sorry, kids, young people, children. Y'all don't write letters. You know, you write emails. You write tweets. You write, you write messages. Don't be offended. That's just the way it is. It, you know. But in the days of writing letters, when you got down to the end of the letter and you wanted to summarize what you were saying or, or whatever... The, the, the words that you used at the end of the document mattered. 
So why would, would John, at the end of this book, at the end of Scripture, why would God have John put this in there? Because it's a very serious thing to add to and to take away from God's Word. Part of listening to God's Word and part of doing God's Word, part of being able to, to live in God's Word, is that we be very careful with the way that we apply it. You know, it's not a, again, it's not a matter of just knowing it intellectually. It's a matter of doing it. And in order to do it, we have to, we have to make application. But as our brother Tim used to say so often, we need to be very careful that our application does not, that we do not elevate our application to the same status as Scripture. We just need to be careful. We have to do it. But we always understand that if we're going to teach something to somebody, what we want to teach them first of all is the Scripture itself. And then secondly or thirdly, we teach them the way in which we apply it. But what is important is the Scripture itself. So, Moses says to the children of Israel, listen and do so that you may live. Let's see what he does next. In verses 3 and 4, he says this. He says, your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. What we need to understand in order to understand what Moses is saying here is we need to be reminded of what took place at Peor. Here's a very quick summary. It's in Numbers chapter 12 that the people of Israel rebel against God and against Moses when they refuse to believe the report of the two faithful spies and they choose to, rep to believe the report of the ten unfaithful spies. And they rebel against God and they refuse to go into the promised land because they are sure that God has, is leading them into a trap and that he's, he's, he's not going to go into the land with them. And so we see this happen in Numbers 10 and, and then it goes on, Numbers 12, and then it goes on from there. And finally along at about Numbers 22, 23, 25, somewhere in there, we see an ugly incident take place at, at, at Peor. And it's there that the children of Israel begin to intermarry with the inhabitants of the land, with the Midianites. And they begin to sacrifice offerings to their gods. And they begin to worship Baal, a, a, an, an earthy and a, a god of fertility and just, just a, a god of, of, of human lust. Much like the gods that were put before us today that we are to worship. Which as children of God we cannot worship. And so Moses is saying to them, he says, remember what happened at, at Baal Peor. Psalm 106 has a very good summary of what happened. The psalmist says, Then they despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the lands. Then they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds, and a plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stayed. So on the exodus, the children of Israel, as they do so many times, they commit this, this great sin. They've been led out of Egypt. They have forgotten about the God who led them out of slavery in Egypt. They forget about the God who is feeding them every day with manna from heaven. They, they see that he provides enough for today, but they're never quite sure that he's going to provide tomorrow, even though he's done it for the last 3,000 years, 3,000 days, or however many years it is. They just never can quite trust that he's going to provide. And they're always looking for ways to provide for themselves. And one of the ways in which they provide for themselves is they want to worship a God that they can see. And the fact that this God is a God of fertility and, 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 and human lust, well, that's even better. We can indulge ourselves. And so they, they engage themselves to the people of the land. And God sends a plague. And then someone from the assembly stands up and intervenes, and God stays the plague. And Moses tells the people of, of Israel here in um, 
verse 4, he said, But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. So it wasn't inevitable that everybody in Israel was going to disobey God. It wasn't inevitable. Many chose to disobey and to embrace the God of the land that they were in. And they paid for their disobedience with their, with their lives. They died. But these people who Moses is, is addressing on this day, they're people who chose to remain faithful to God. What's one of our takeaways from this? One of our takeaways from this is that obedience encourages obedience. Disobedience encourages disobedience. I'm going to get a nod from, my, from, from the heads of those who are here who are in, with whom we are in a life group together. How many times, and just so you all know, today is Manera Tuil's birthday. But how many times in life group have we heard Manera sharing about what she is doing as far as ministry goes and how she is being obedient to the Lord? You're with me. How she's being obedient to the Lord. And our desire to be obedient is encouraged because of this, because of this, this widow who consistently and quietly is reaching out to people that nobody else is reaching out to and giving herself and giving her, her body, her time, her money to serve others that, that even those of us in this church don't necessarily see and want to serve. How many times have we been encouraged to disobedience because of the example of a friend? Ben mentioned this uh, in the prayer today, in the pastoral prayer. I, I don't exactly remember exactly how you said it. But one of the things that we have set out to do from the time that Southfield began in 1994 we have set out to be a community of believers who encourage each other. And what we want to do is we want to encourage each other to be faithful to Christ. We believe in discipleship. You know, in one-on-one -on -one discipleship, that's great. But that's not the only method. We need to remember that when we come together as a, as a body of Christ, that we are discipling each other, even when we don't know that anybody else is, is watching Anybody else is listening. So what we want to do is we want to be the kind of people that encourage others to be obedient. And we do that by our words and we do that by our actions. We don't want to have to give an account to God because we threw stumbling blocks in people's way or we put millstones around their necks. The lesson from verses 3 and 4 is very simple. Obey God and live. Disobey God and die. Moses goes on in beginning with verse 5. He says, see, I have taught you statutes and rules. Again, he uses that phrase. As the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you this day? As Moses is, is talking here, there's a difference in, in the verb tense that he uses. In verse 1 of this passage, Moses said, all these things, all these statutes and rules that I am teaching you, present tense. Here in verse 5, he says, I have taught you, past tense or perfect tense. You know, one of the things that, that Moses is able to claim here is that he is obeying what God asked him to do. And that was to, to, to teach the children of Israel. He was faithful in that. But we also know that as Moses is, is gathered together with Israel on the banks of the Jordan, uh, and as Moses you know, could, could look and see the land, Moses knows that he is not going to be able to go into the land. Why? Because Moses has disobeyed God. 
And Moses has struck the rock rather than speaking to the rock, the rock to, to bring forth the water that the people needed. And in looking at that and in thinking about this, we are reminded of this. All of our lives matter to Jesus. He calls for obedience in every area. We're not saying that we have to be perfect. We won't be. But we want to be aware of the fact that it's not okay to live in the light most of the time and in the dark part of the time. We want to bring every part of our life under, under the, the sovereignty of, of God and to, and to give him control over every particular part of our life. He says that our saving and safety comes from knowing and doing God's words. We are to know God's word and we are to do God's word. Again, you know, I'm reminded of, of that admonition from James in James chapter 3 where James warns his readers he says you know guys not many of you should become teachers my brothers for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness so one of the things that you can pray for Ben and I as we preach on a regular basis one of the things that you can pray for our life group leaders as they lead our groups on a regular basis is that we would bring all of our lives under the obedience of Jesus and that we would, we would not harbor sin in any part of our lives. As that, and that is the same thing that we are praying for you guys. That for each one of us, we would live lives that, are, that are, are constantly growing in obedience in every possible way. Well, again, part of the benefit of reading through Scripture, knowing Scripture, and seeing how it all applies, because it's all one book, comes when, with what Moses is saying here in the, in the last part of this passage. He says, you know, keep these things, do them, for that will be your wisdom and understanding in the sight of who? In the sight of the peoples who when they hear, when they hear all these statutes, they'll say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous is all this law that I set before you today. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 when he's talking about the difference between speaking in tongues and speaking in prophecies in the church. And in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, he talks about what happens if an unbeliever comes in he says, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Again, part of our evangelism strategy it's not just one on one evangelism it's not just confrontational stranger evangelism it's not just friendship evangelism but it is the evangelism of the people of God gathered together with others who are observing how our lives are different because of, of who God has called us to be and because of who Jesus is in our lives and they can witness how we love one another and how we love others and at some point, they, they fall on their knees and they say, I want what you have. I want what you have. So Moses then goes on to say in our closing passage, he says, beginning in verse 9, he says, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. This is key. Make them known to your children and your children's children. How on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, and Horeb is, is where God gave the Ten Commandments, where you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. 
Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you're going over to possess. Moses says three things here. He says, first of all, in verse 9, he says, take care. The second thing he says is, keep your soul diligently so that you don't forget. And then the third thing he says is, teach your children and your children's children. To take care means to pay attention to something on a continuous basis. There never is a time for the believer in Christ when we can say, what I'm about to do doesn't matter. There never comes a time that we can, that we can take off. You know, I love football. I've been watching football. I've been loving all the games. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when they're talking about how players play, you know, one of the things that you'll hear scouts and, and, and commentators say a lot of times is, okay, this guy never takes a play off. His motor burns it, you know, it burns hard, and he's, he's, he's giving it full effort every play. Other times they'll say, oh, man, this guy's so talented. But sometimes he just takes a play or two off him and just kind of disappears from the scene, you know. I would take games off, you know, or something like that. But, um, uh, but when it comes to our Christian life, there's never a time that we can just take time off. We always have to pay attention to what's going on in our lives. Moses said, keep your soul. To, to keep your soul means to guard it. And the picture uh, that we have is the picture that, that we see in Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, when, when Peter has been arrested, you know, when, when Herod has killed James, and Peter has been arrested by Herod, uh, and, and what he intended to do was he was going to have uh, Herod, uh, he was going to have Peter brought out, um, you know, uh, during the celebration, and he was basically going to execute Peter in a public way like he had done with James, it says that when Herod arrested Peter, he put him in the custody of four squads of soldiers. So that's the picture when it says keep your soul. It's that, that whole idea of keeping something in, in close custody. And then he says, teach this to your children and your grandchildren. Deuteronomy 6 is the famous passage that we have in just a couple more chapters of what it means to teach these things to your children and grandchildren. Let me share you with you a story of how that played out in my life. We, um, we, had, we had a great Christmas. And part of what made it great was all three of our children were able to be with us and our grandchildren were able to be with us. So we were all together on Christmas Day and then we were able to be together again the day after Christmas on that Monday. And when we were together, um, at, at some point on Monday, uh, Alyssa and her family had gone home, and Kara was going to go, um, go out with uh, uh, Caitlin and our daughter-in-law, Carly, and they were going to do some shopping. And so they took the girls with them. So Nelson was still at the house, Josh was at the house, and Nelson's three sons were at the house. At some point that afternoon, I got a call from one of our branch managers in another city. And um, branch manager said, hey, I just got a call from the police. Uh, they say that the door on our ATM is open and they want me to come take a look at it. I said, okay, I tell you what, I've got my computer here. Uh, I said, how long is it gonna take? He said, about, th about 20 minutes. I said, okay, you go ahead and go. I'm gonna pull up the video and I'm gonna just check it out and see if I see anything that you, know, you need to be aware of. It looks like anybody, anybody did anything. Okay, and I said, we'll, we'll talk, you know, when you get there. Um, so my three grandsons, who were who are 10, 8, and 6, were up in the office with me. And I said, hey, guys, come over here. Let me show you what I can do. Uh, and so I pulled up, fired up the laptop, logged in, uh, and pulled up this particular branch location that's in another city and started looking at the video. I said, I want to show you all this is part of my job, just making sure that we keep things safe at work and all that. And so we were looking at it, and I was talking to him about, you know, you know, camera stories, you know, uh, video stories and all. And they were asking some really great questions. 
And so um, uh, we were looked, and we didn't see anything that showed anybody trying to do something they shouldn't have done. So about that time, the branch manager had arrived there, and she called me back. I said, okay, guys, y'all be, y'all be quiet. Y'all be very quiet. This call's just going to take just a minute or two. So, you know, put her on speakerphone and uh, said, hey, I don't see anything that anybody tried to do anything. She said, no, it looks like somebody twisted off a key in there, and that's why the door's not closed. Okay. So in true Texas fashion, our, our solution was, she said, I'm going to go get some duct tape. And we're going we're to we're tape the door. Hey, that works, you know, just so that it's not obvious, you know. And so that's, that's what we did with it. But as we were talking, she said, how's your Christmas been? I said, oh, it's been good. I've, I've had some alarm calls. And so it's kind of, and, you know, and I said, Kara's been sick. So it's, you know, just kind of been up and down. She said, yeah, I've kind of had that kind of a Christmas too. I said, what happened? She said, well, my brother died the Wednesday before Christmas of pancreatic cancer. And she said, and then my two children both got engaged at Christmas. So I've had this, this up and down kind of emotional roller coaster. I said, okay, okay. You know, and so we talked for just a few seconds more and then ended the call. And my grandsons were there. They were watching the video. They had heard what was said. And I said, guys, here's what we do when people share this kind of information with us. I just held up my hands. I said, we're going to hold hands and we're going to pray. And we're going to pray youngest. We're going to do just like we used to do when your dad was growing up. We're going to pray youngest to oldest. And we're going to pray for this person and her family. Everett, the six-year-old, beams because he's the youngest. He gets to pray first. Everett prays the sweetest prayer. It has absolutely nothing to do with this conversation that we just heard. But it was the sweetest prayer. Jesus, thank you for my family. Thank you for Christmas, being able to be all of that. But then Wesley, the 8-year-old, and Bennett, the 10-year-old, they zeroed in on what we just heard. Be with this, this, this woman and her family in the loss of her brother and his family losing their dad and be with her children getting ready to get married. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses tells Israel, I want you to teach your children. I want you to teach them purposely. I want you to, to decide how you're going to teach them and do it on a regular basis. And I also want you to teach them as the opportunity comes up, as situations arise. I said to my, grand, to my grandsons, this is what we do when people share this kind of information with us. We pray for them. And if we say we're going to pray for them, we pray for them. This is what Moses is telling the children of Israel as they get ready to go into the, into the promised land. Keep watch over your soul. Take care. Keep these things diligently. And then teach them to your children and your grandchildren. So what does this have to do with the gospel? Well, what it has to do with the gospel is this. You know, a lot of times we can hear a passage like this. We can hear a sermon like this. And, and sometimes what we hear is all these things that we have to do. But let's set the bigger context. Moses is giving these instructions to a, to a nation that he has already called into relationship with him. And God is the one who took the initiative to call them into this relationship. Again, we can't make ourselves any more appealing to God. We can't do anything to, to cause him to love us any more than he already does. Once he saves us, yes, we are to respond. And, and when one of the ways in which we respond is by obeying him and by doing what he asks us to do. But, but again, these, context, these, these commands are given in the context of, of God speaking to a people and, and showing them what he's already done. What has God already done? One, he's already chosen them to be his people. Two, he has rescued them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Three, he has guided them through the desert for, th for, for 40 years. And even in the middle of all of their rebellion, he has not abandoned them. 
He has brought them to the promised land. If there are those among you here today who have never said yes to Jesus, I want you to know that Jesus today is initiating his call to you. And he's calling on you to trust him. And that simple trust, that, that, that call to trust him begins with just coming up and talking to me or talking to Ben and just simply saying, I want to believe Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. We'll pray with you. We'll work with you. We want you to enjoy the security that God's people have. What does this have to do with communion? Why are we using this as our, as our lead into communion today, which we're getting ready to take? It's simply this. When we celebrate communion, we're remembering our past. Our past is Jesus on the cross. Everything that Jesus went through in being led to the cross and nailed to the cross and dying on the cross for our sins. Our sins that we've committed, our sins that we're committing now, and our sins that we will commit. All of those were nailed to Jesus on the cross. But we don't leave him on the cross. We celebrate the fact that when he was laid into the tomb that nobody had ever been laid in, that three days later that tomb was empty and he was not there. Our past is Jesus on the cross. Our future is the empty tomb and the resurrected Savior. Let's pray. And then Carson and the praise team are going to come and lead us as Cleve and the men hand out the elements, and Ben is coming to lead us in the taking of the elements. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the way in which you have revealed yourself to us. Jesus, we ask that as we prepare to take communion, Father, that we would be reminded of, of what you have saved us from and what you are saving us for. Father, that we would love you and rejoice with you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.